Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the latent change score model. In this video I will show you how you can specify a latent change score model in the M Plus software. Before I begin with that I want to say a few words about this channel for those of you who may be new. Um, in this channel I provide weekly statistics tutorials primarily related to latent variable models such as structural equation models, confirmatory factor analysis and latent class analysis and mixture modeling but also other techniques. And so if you're interested in these sorts of tutorials please subscribe to this channel. Also if you like the video then please hit the like button in the description. Um, for this video you also find other resources, other um, videos and workshops as well as books so check that out as well. Now in this video I want to talk one more time about the latent change score model and I have two other videos on this channel for which you find the links also below in the description in which I introduced the latent change score model mathematically and explained um, how this is defined, how we can introduce latent different score variables that reflect inter-individual differences in change over time. I showed in my second video how you can simplify the specification of a latent change score model by reformulating it so that it's easier to specify in structural equation modeling software. And so if you haven't seen those other videos yet, then I suggest that you check those out first, especially if you're not yet very familiar with the idea of latent change score models to begin with because it'll make it easier to follow this video in which I focus on the software application in M+. In my first video on the latent change score model, I presented this parametrization that you can see here on this picture, where um, the latent difference score factor tau2 minus tau1 is introduced in the structural model by this simplistic equation that says that tau2, the latent variable at time 2 is a function of the latent variable at time 1, tau 1 plus the difference tau 2 minus tau 1. So this um, sim simple or tautological equation allows us to include this additional variable, this additional latent variable tau 2 minus tau 1 in our structural model. This variable tau 2 minus tau 1 reflects the latent change over time or true change, change in the true scores across time. And so we can put this into a structural model like this. Now, in my second video, I then showed that this model can be reformulated into an equivalent model that is easier to specify in structural equation modeling software than this version here, where you have to somehow find a way to trick your program into um, estimating the variance and mean for this latent difference score variable that is not directly connected to observed variables. And so in order to make this a little bit easier to specify, you can reformulate this model into an equivalent model version that looks like this, where the tau2 factor, so say, disappears because we insert what we have for the structural equation into our measurement equation, and then we can um, reduce, so say, this model in this way to where we only have the time 1 factor tau 1 and the difference factor tau 2 minus tau 1, similar to what we have in a latent growth curve model where we also have only our intercept factor and our change factor or growth factor or slope factor. And so this can be done also in the latent change score approach like this. And this makes it easier to specify this model with structural equation modeling software because now you have two variables that are directly linked to observed variables. And so you can then very easily specify these variables, for example, in M plus using the by statement for um, a measurement model. Now notice that uh, after this reformulation, all variables load onto the time one factor, both the time one variables on the left hand side here and the time two variables on the right hand side. And they load with the same loadings. That's of importance. You can see that the loadings here are constrained to be time invariant, as is typically the case when we have a longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis model. We um, try to ensure measurement equivalence, equivalence of the loadings, and also equivalence of the intercepts, which are not 
shown here for strong measurement equivalence so that we can meaningfully interpret changes in the latent variables. The variables at time two, so they have double loadings. They load on the time one factor and also on the change factor. And again, that parallels what you have in a latent growth curve model where also the intercept factor um, or all variables load onto the intercept factor and then um, only the variables at time two, time three and so on will load onto a growth factor or slope factor. So that is similar here. And so this model, um, I want to show you now how you can specify that in the M plus software for this simple example where you have two time points and three variables um, that are repeatedly observed as indicators of latent change and the latent state. So let's go into M plus and I'll show you what the syntax looks like for a model like this. Here you can see that we have our variable names list where we have actually four time points and then I picked just the first two time points here for this illustration to keep this simple and manageable with the demo version of M+. Um, you can see here we have Y11, Y21, Y31. Those are the three variables at time one. And then we have the same variables again measured at time two, Y12, Y22, and Y32. And so we set up the model in exactly the way as it was shown in the path diagram on the slide and you can see that tau1, the intercept factor so to say, or the time1 factor has all variables on it, all variables load onto this factor and of importance the loadings are constrained to be the same for the time1 and the time2 variables respectively so that you can see that um, for example the second variable at time1 has the same loading as the second variable at time2 and that is ensured by giving the same label here in parenthesis, which is L2 for lambda2 or loading2, so that M plus knows this factor loading for this indicator should be the same across time for loading invariance for measurement equivalence. And then also for the third indicator, we have a label to constrain that factor loading to be time invariant. Also, here it shows the label L3 for the third loading. Notice that the first variable does not have a label in parentheses because this loading is fixed to one. So for identification by default and plus uses the first indicator for each factor and fixes the loading to one by default. So we don't even have to say anything. And so we can use that default when we specify our longitudinal model. And so then we just have to remember that this first variable or the reference variable also needs to have a fixed loading at one at time two, because we also want to uh, constrain this loading to be time invariant. And so since this loading is not estimated but fixed, we need to fix it at each time point so that it's also the same value, that it has the same value across time for measurement equivalence. So that's um, a slight um, complication, so to say, that you have to think of when you specify this model, that this loading needs to be fixed to one, whereas this one you don't have to say at one because M plus by default does it. The next variable is then our change factor. So that's the variable that on the slide was called tau2 minus tau1. Here I called it change21. And on this variable, only the variables that are measured at time two have loadings with, again, the same labels for measurement equivalence. And so these loadings, again, need to be the same as before. The first loading of the reference variable is, again, fixed to one by default in M+. And then the other loadings are constrained to be the same loadings as um, the loadings that they have on the tau1 factor. So we use the same labels L2 and L3 here. Furthermore, for strong measurement equivalence, we also need to ensure that the intercepts are constrained to be time invariant. And the way that I did this here was by fixing the intercepts of the reference variable Y1 to zero at bo both time points so that I can identify the latent mean of the 
time one factor and also of the change score factor. Now, this is not the only way in which you can identify the latent mean structure. There are also other strategies, but this is one that works and that is one that I used here. There are other equivalent ways that you could use as well. Now, the, the remaining intercepts then are constrained to be time invariant by using a label, which means those intercepts are estimated. However, they're estimated to the same value at each time point. And here the label I2 means that the intercept for the second variable is supposed to be estimated to the same value at both time points. And then the same for the third variable. So what we're doing here parallels what we did for the loadings. The first loading is fixed because that's our reference variable fixed to one. The other loadings are estimated but set equal. And now we're doing the same thing for the intercepts. The first intercept is fixed, fixed to zero. And then the other intercepts are constrained to be time invariant. That allows us to then estimate the latent means for both the initial factor and the change factor. So change factor mean is, for example, of interest when you are when you want to know whether there's average change over time, you can take a look at that change score mean. And so that can be estimated as a free parameter here. And that's what happens in the last subcommand here in the model statement that we um, request the latent means. I will show you the output and go through that um, in a separate video so that you can also see what you get for a latent change score model. Now, maybe um, as an additional comment, you can expand this input file, this model, by using, for example, predictor variables of change. So, for example, if you have an intervention study or experimental study with a control group and a treatment group, then you could have a dummy variable, for example, that is coded 0, 1, 0 for control group, 1 for experimental or treatment group, and you could include that as a predictor variable of the initial factor and the change factor to find out, for example, whether there's differential change depending on whether somebody was in the control group or in an experimental group. You would include that dummy variable in the use variable list and then also you would include an on statement that says, for example, tau1 um, change to 1 on dummy. And so then you could have a regression on that dummy variable or other variables. You could include covariates, age, gender, um, whatever you have as potential predictors of change or control variables that you want to include. So that is also something that um, is a possibility um, to analyze in a change score model like this. I hope you like this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and to subscribe to this channel. Also, uh, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section if um, you have something that you would like to share or a question that you would like to ask. And um, I see, I'll see you next time.